What's up, guys? So, my fair weather friend, Spring, made it look like we were supposed to have this really, really early spring. No more freezes. I got really excited. Now, I didn't plant out anything that could be affected by that, but it looks like next Wednesday. We've got one more day where it's supposed to possibly dip down to 31. I'm not too concerned about it, but I'm outside planting a few things that are supposed to be pretty frost tolerant. Worst case scenario, you just deal with the circumstances. They're mostly flowers, my rudbeckias and some scabiosas. From my understanding, now I've never grown scabiosas. This is our first year doing that, but they're supposed to do fairly well, even if there's like a light frost, which is all that we're seeing on the horizon right now. So we're planting some stuff out in the perennial garden and I figured I would bring you guys outside with me. I'm also gonna be putting some flowers into the kitchen garden as well and harvesting some lettuce. The garden's looking great. I'm really excited to start putting in the spring plants. I've got well over 4,000 that are gonna need to go into both gardens collectively, not both gardens separately, pretty sure. <laughs> but it's gonna be massive planting this year. It looks like my scarlet sage got a little bit of damage when we dipped down, I think it was like 34 the other night. So this right here, this is scarlet sage, and you can see it got a little bit of damage on the leaves, but the ones on the bottom are okay. So scarlet sage and sage in general is a tad bit more sensitive to the frost. So yeah, we'll have to just see how these do. I do. I do have more scarlet sage plants, so if need be, I could replace them. But I'm really excited. You can see the daffodils are coming up. We're getting some tulips that are coming in. So it's just really exciting. I can feel the spring in the air. It doesn't hurt that it's like 77 degrees today. That definitely feels like spring as well, so. Where are you dig? Where am I gonna dig? Mm. Let's see what we've got first. Let's see what we have to plant. These are Indian summer rudbeckias. I love those. You do? Maybe we'll plant them right here in this front walkway. What do you think? Okay. You think it's great? And then... No, great. Great? Oh, look. Duckies. Yeah. They're drinking water. I know the duckies are drinking water. All right. Hey, Yep, those are some young chickens. All right, I think we're gonna plant these over and through here. Now, basically what I've done is I have, for example, these are Indian summer rudbeckias right here that we started from seed. I am going to plant some of these in the perennial garden, which is where I would like them to stay. And some of these are gonna go in the kitchen garden because since they are perennials, I'm gonna give about half of the plants, you say hi, yeah. I'm gonna give about half of the plants that really nice loamy soil that's perfect for starting perennials in the kitchen garden. So that way I can ensure that they do really well. Careful, please. And then I'll move them in the fall into the actual perennial garden. These ones are gonna go straight in here though and we're just gonna see how they do. Fingers crossed they do okay. Mom, I'm That's awesome, baby cakes. Um, I talked about the Indian summer rudbeckias. Those can get between a foot to three feet tall. And then over here, we have orange fudge rudbeckias. And these are the smallest. These are only gonna get to be about 20 inches. And then we have some formula mix scabiosas. These are not perennial in nature unless we were in a warmer climate. However, what I can say is that they often self seed. So now there are perennial scabiosas out there. I know, what is it, Thema Deep Blue? I might be saying it wrong, but that's one of the ones that is a perennial. And then we have the Salmon Queen scabiosas. So these are pretty much my border plants. These are what I'm going to do right on the outside over here. And then my taller perennials like I'm trying to think of them all off the top of my head. And then and then my taller perennials are gonna go in behind that and they're gonna stagger up planting wise. And then this year we're gonna do a lot of squash and a lot of melons possibly in here. 
I say possibly because I know we're doing some, but I don't have it fully nailed down how many melons we're putting in here. And then we're gonna be doing our corn back there where we typically do. So we're gonna have a lot of vegetables growing in here with our other perennials. Um, we're just gonna see how it all works out. But yeah, so this is a border area. Now I do also have like scarlet sage. I don't know if you can see it. I do also have some scarlet sage that I talked to you about already. And then on the edge of all of these walkways are where our strawberries are. We got a ton of strawberries last year. And then, but the goats have been breaking into the garden and eating my, I have hair, eating my strawberry plants. Strawberries do okay when they get cut back. So I'm, I'm thinking they'll be fine. Eventually the strawberries are, will grow into giant mounds and just fall over the edge. But progress takes time, it doesn't happen overnight. So I'm gonna start planting these and then we'll see where this takes us. It may not look like much now, but hopefully, if it all works out, it'll be something really, really beautiful this summer. So, if you couldn't tell, vegetables are my, my thing. I can teach you how to grow a vegetable garden. That's not an issue. <laughs> but perennial flowers, although I have all the knowledge, I've done all the studying, I have all the research, you know, I have, I've got that. I think sometimes we forget to account for nature and you can do everything the exact right way and sometimes it's still not going to work out and i get really disappointed when that happened so this is hence why i have my uh fail safe system going on right now where i'm doing part of it in the kitchen garden and the other part of the kitchen garden. all right so now i have a bunch of odds and ends essentially certain things that are in solo cups that i feel like i want to plant out here even though it's not the most ideal time, I feel like I want to give it a shot. So things like lovage, which is a perennial herb, it grows a really long taproot and it can get really, really tall. Lovage is really big and it starts off small and then it grows into something spectacular. So this is going to go in the perennial garden. I've got some Flora Norton sweet peas. In fact, you know, honestly, I might just put this whole thing. I might put all of this in the perennial garden. Hi, bubs. I'm jumping around a lot. I think I'm actually gonna plant some of these scabiosas over here in this first bed. So I did designate these two beds right here, two perennial flowers and a handful of annuals just because they're pretty and I like them. Now, things like zinnias, I've always intermingled with the rest of the garden and I am gonna do that again this year, but I'm also gonna put them in the perennial garden um, in like a big mound of them. But right here, I've got this whole section of onions and I have onions in a lot of the beds. There's onions pretty much everywhere at this point. That is partially my fault and partially Ducky's fault because Ducky would get into those back six beds where I had originally planted the onions and she would attack them and scratch them up. And so I have some back there, but then I also moved a ton to like the front of the garden and Ducky is no longer in the garden. So we solved that problem, but now there's onions everywhere, which is fine because we use a lot of onions. But nevertheless, these onions are gonna come out Oh, probably in about three months based off of the size that they are. Now there are recommendations for how long to leave your onions in the ground and things like that. But for me, I will watch my onions when the tops start to die back into a yellow and I can see a nice bulb in the ground. That's my sign that it's time for them to come up. That's just the best way to do it is to look at it and to be like, okay, that's, that's time. Um, Cause if you can't really decipher that it's time and you pull them too early, you're gonna damage it. You can't really go back on it too much. So I'm going to put some scabiosas in here with the onions. Okay. 
this is the formula, Scabiosa's right here. Oh, see, this is one of those FEMA deep blue ones. I am gonna put that in here for sure this year and then those will get moved. Is it FEMA? It's FAMA, FAMA deep blue is what that is. Um, okay. And these right here, these are Walla Walla sweet onions. That's what we have in this bed for the most part. Along with some lovely wheat. Stop, please. Thank you. If you don't talk to your plants like a crazy gardener, are you even a crazy gardener? <laughs> Does it count if you don't talk to them? I'm not sure. Now, to be honest, part of my motivation for getting these outdoors and I have been hardening them off, and the research does show that, surprisingly enough, even though scabiosas are not typically considered frost tolerant, they can handle a light freeze in the spring, and if they have damaged leaves, you can trim them off. Um, obviously, with gardening, you're going to find mixed opinions on everything. I really think it's best that for the bulk of your knowledge base, if you're not studying horticulture yourself, that you find somebody who's been growing the plants that you are wanting to plant for a long time. I don't love gardening shorts because the gardening ones, um, specifically found on sites like TikTok and things like that, because oftentimes they'll put information in there and it's not correct. I, I do make shorts, especially on other platforms. A lot of it is cooking. Um, occasionally I'll talk about something related to gardening, but a lot of the gardening knowledge that I talk about is on YouTube because the proof is in the pudding, in my opinion. And I feel this way, I'm gonna bring it a little bit closer because now I'm getting chatty. I feel this way because just like everybody at the end of the day, or when you have some downtime, you might look at your phone, you might scroll through some videos and, and watch some stuff. I cannot tell you the number of gardening reels that I have seen, you know, the really short ones that are like under 15 seconds that give you gardening advice that are dead wrong. Like, like they're completely wrong. It completely goes against everything that horticulturalists have been saying for a long time. It goes against the grain for people who have actually been gardening and growing on a massive scale for a really long time. And I get it. I get rebel gardening. There are things that I do differently that go against the horticultural standard. But if and when I am doing those things, I give you a reason as to why, why it has worked for me. If you're going to listen to gardening advice from either a horticulturalist or a gardener, I really feel like the proof should be in the pudding. You should be able to see their garden. You should be able to see their research if they've published. You should be able to see that what they're talking about is, is genuine and real. Whereas in those really short reels that you get where somebody's like, you should... I really don't like talking about what other people say and do, but to, to not like call anybody out, there was this reel that was made where some, some guy was like, you should decapitate your tomatoes and that will give you the best yield. That is so wrong. It's so wrong. It's so wrong. It's so wrong. And he had like hundreds of comments where people were like, I'm going to try this this year. And my heart just broke because I'm like, no, please don't. Please don't try that because then you're going to be super bummed out when you do get this really awful yield, especially with indeterminate varieties of tomatoes that continue to grow and, and get to like eight feet tall. I mean, it's just not right. And you can go online and you can say this is not correct, but you're still going to have a bajillion people who have decided that since they're seeing it on this reel that this is, this is accurate and they're going to try it and they're going to be disappointed. And I worry that those people are going to be put off of gardening and growing food when they have a bad experience like this because they don't know any better than to not listen to really bad advice. So it really bothers me 
when that happens. And I follow the general rule of thumb that if you're gonna give advice, there should be evidence. That's why in my personal life, especially in interactions with the church or even with family members, I will not argue with somebody if they're trying to assassinate my character. If they're trying to say something about me that I that just isn't, I, most of the time I just won't even defend myself and not because I can't stand up for myself, because trust me, I can. It's, it's because I truly, truly believe that the proof is in the pudding. That if you are an honest, kind, good, genuine person, that that will show over time. And although it might really suck in the moment to have somebody saying the opposite about you, again, the proof is in the pudding. You are going to be known by your character for those who are around you for a long period of time. I can give you an example that, I can give you several examples because people are so quick to make assumptions and judgments about you as a person. I've had numerous times where people have said something about me that wasn't true and I'm sure you have too. That's kind of one of the walks of life. If you've been around other people at some point or another, somebody's going to say something hurtful or make a snap judgment that isn't true and you have to kind of choose what to do with it. Do you fight back with everything you have or do you say, okay, like I know this isn't true. The people who know me know this isn't true and you either will figure it out on your own or you won't, but I'm not going to live and die by your opinion because typically if somebody is saying something awful about you, why would you care what their opinion is in the first place? You know? And I feel like that attitude spills over into gardening. <sighs> I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling now. So I guess the point of this long-winded ramble out of nowhere that I was not expecting or prepared for is please be careful when you are watching reels or shorts and you see somebody giving gardening advice. Do your research, do your homework, make sure the proof is in the pudding, make sure they know what they're talking about. Don't just go and decapitate, please do not decapitate your tomatoes. I am begging you, if you watch this channel, please don't do that. I want you to have the best tomato harvest of your life. Do not decapitate your tomatoes. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. These sorts of videos, I don't ever plan out. I just bring you guys out here with me and I just kind of start talking. It's the same thing with actually all of the videos, just about occasionally I'll put a good amount of time and effort into it, like when I'm talking about my uh, what I'm growing this year and why, or specific topics like hardening off your plants or things of that nature. I'll, I'll kind of sit down and be like, this is the target of what I'm going for. Or my favorite tips for starting things from seeds. This is what I feel like is really important to cover. But for the most part, I don't really plan out these videos at all. And I think that very much shows when I just start randomly rambling about other things or just completely off topic. <laughs> all right, before I jump back into the perennial garden, I'm going to plant this Roman chamomile. Roman chamomile, if you don't know, is perennial chamomile. Um, German chamomile is most commonly the chamomile used in chamomile tea, although you can use both. They do have a slightly different flavor, but they're both chamomile. Um, German chamomile, oh, hi, Mr. Bumblebee. German chamomile, you're gonna replant every year. You can find that it will self-sow if you let the flowers dry on the plants, but Roman chamomile is a perennial and it'll come back year after year. So on this side right here, I have German chamomile. On this side, I'm attacking the trellis and I have Roman chamomile. I'm also going to plant in this garden, before we go back into the perennial garden, is some petunias. Oftentimes you will see people planting petunias in hanging baskets. They look astoundingly beautiful because they kind of drape. But petunias are also fantastic companion plants for things like potatoes. They're just known to be really beneficial at helping ward off bugs, especially around things like potatoes. So we're gonna plant some petunias around our potatoes this year. We're gonna give that a try. Now I've done things like basil and marigolds and things like that. The thing with companion planting is you have to mass plant things. You have to do a lot of marigolds. So if you're doing in-ground gardening, you can do an entire row of marigolds and then a row of tomatoes and another row of marigolds and it can help. 
I'm not gonna give up my growing space to having 70, 500 marigold plants. I don't like them that much. But that comes at, you know, potentially the cost of having more pests on my tomatoes. And how are you gonna deal with that? So we are going to go plant the petunias around the potatoes. I'm not planting so many, but it's probably gonna make a difference. But it's gonna be really pretty. So, hi Bubs. Hi hey, Mom. What's up? Nope, don't push the button. You press that button and it goes off. Yeah, it's true, it does go off. Does it need to go off? I love your face, baby. Careful, that one has a little bumblebee, a honeybee on it. I like honey. I like honey too. Do you see, come here, look, you see the little bee right there? Do you see him right there? He's on that flower. He moved, do you see him? He's that little guy right there. He is a honeybee, don't touch him. But look how tiny he is. Hi. Yeah, he makes honey. We should say thank you, friend. Thank you, friend. Thank you, friend. Yeah, that was so nice. Good job, buddy. Oh, thank you. A lot of mulch in this one spot. Yeah, I love mulch. <laughs> You're so cute. The bumblebee, the bumblebee, it makes uh, and. We can make, we can make honey by ourselves. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you heard him. No, I didn't hurt him. That's exactly where he goes. Good job. You want to give me five? Yeah. It goes there. It does go there. All right, now we got to go plant some more stuff in the perennial garden. All right, y'all. That's going to wrap up this video. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. Say bye. Bye. Good job.